In summary, my art is all about saudades, the Portuguese word which is untranslatable, which means loneliness. It means to, to miss a place where one has never been to, or to miss someone one has never met. So that is my art, and that's what you see behind me. Let us talk about understanding the artistic language of crypto Jews. Since the Spanish and Portuguese Inquisitions of the 15th century, a group interchangeably known as Maranos, Conversos, New Christians, crypto Jews or simply gente da nação, has had significant representation within the arts. By observing the depictions made by crypto Jewish artists, their descendants, or by non Jewish creators who feature them as subjects, such as sitters, muses, models, one may find a vocabulary which forms the basis of a crypto-Jewish artistic language. Thus, the purpose here is to further observe, hypothesize, and understand the nuances of crypto-Jewish language and representation in the arts. Perhaps one of the earliest art forms to adopt the role of the Iberian crypto-Jew, or the Iberian Jew at the time, was, among its, uh, was within literature and theater. Here, the forcibly converted Sephardic Jew was often featured as an introspective, worldly, disturbed, and often vengeful character. This type of representation has made an appearance through old and new characters, as in the iconic Shylock, as everyone knows, from Shakespeare. The crypto-Jewish uh, character, who's based on a real person, Dona Branca Dias, in the Brazilian play O Santo Inquérito, by Alfredo de Freitas Gomes Dias, Antonio José da Silva in the Portuguese drama O Judeu, and Borgia, which is a Netflix hit series. And uh, it's about a conversal family who took over the Roman papal seat. It's called Borgia, Faith and Fear by Tom Fontana from 2011. Hidden Jews have also been speculated to be featured in a number of well-known narratives, often serving as romantic observations of an author's own Murano heritage. For instance, Don Quixote has long been theorized to be about Cervantes' own suspected crypto-Jewish roots. The same may, may be said about the legend of El Zorro, who is partially based on an individual named Lamport, who spent seven years in the chambers of the Mexican Inquisition, where he became well acquainted with prisoners who were mostly Jews or converted Jews. Lamport became the inspiration for the masked hero as he managed to escape from prison, from prison on the 26th of December in 1650, plastering the city walls at night with posters denouncing the crimes of the inquisitors. As Lamport was captured again, he wrote many pamphlets in Spanish attacking the Inquisition until he was condemned to burn at the stake in the Auto de Fe of the 19th of November, 1659. Although the convertible Judeos are often featured in overly romanticized ways, fictional crypto Jews seem to have seeped into America's top sitcoms, sitcoms as clannish and sometimes provincial individuals. Alan Sandler from the Jewish Journal, for instance, suggests that American franchises like Everybody Loves Raymond and Seinfeld are, in fact, strong portrayals of crypto Jewish behavior in contemporary America. I know it sounds a little like a stretch, but let's uh, keep going. When you watch Everybody Loves Raymond, you take it for granted that the barons, or barones, are Italian, right? But is Raymond a crypto Jew? Back in the old days, in the Hollywood created by the founding fathers, Goldwyn, Meyer, and Warner Brothers, there were no Jewish characters on the screen, only idealized white Christians. As Hollywood grew and flourished, television and film began to be populated by what seemed to be Jewish characters. They spoke like Jews, they joked like Jews, they ate like Jews, but were they Jewish? They were hidden Jews, crypto, crypto Jews. Seinfeld, for instance, was a veritable hive of crypto Jews. Jerry himself was, of course, openly Jewish, but what was of the supporting cast? Anyone who wanted to could recognize that George, Elaine, and Kramer were Jews. They were based on real people, all of whom were, in fact, 
Jewish, but on the show they were not. Are the Barons Maranos? Well, the characters on the show are named Barone, generally viewed as an Italian name, but in Italy it is in fact a Jewish name. Crypto-Judaic presence in the past and in contemporary art is indeed a fact. However, the reason for such is still an unknown variable worthy of examining. Perhaps by observing the crypto-Jews of the avant-garde, one may find overlapping characteristics in their social, religious, and psychological profiles, which might have influenced the portrayal of their arts and lives perpetually. As it is the case with most things pertaining to crypto-Jews, inquisition of files from the 15th century to the 17th centuries provide the best observation of their modus vivendi, showing some of the aspects that artists may have found compelling to immortalize in the art. For instance, it is notable that the conversos interrogated by the Inquisition between 1495 and 1500 were mostly city dwellers, not directly connected to the cultivation of the land. These individuals were commonly found within the cosmos of the city as middling artisans, often textiles such as tailors, weavers, dyers, and old clothes dealers. Many were blacksmiths and shoemakers. Another significant portion of the community was of prosperous jewelers and silversmiths, who sometimes acted as moneylenders. Religiously speaking, crypto Jews were, at best, a complex sight to observe. Catholics saw them as new Christians, despite the conversions being forced who had an obligation to hold true to the canons of, the true, of, the new faith, of their new faith. Meanwhile, rabbinical opinion held that most of the converts were to be classified, to be classified in terms of Jewish law as anusim, or as having been forced to accept Christian baptism and thus be treated as full Jews living in error against their will. Hence, the Morano mentality. Along with their strong penitential aspect, may be said to have risen out of their sense of guilt for not completely obeying Jewish religious law and for not being faithful to the teachings of the church. So they were torn. They were very accurately being called souls in conflict. And such dramatic condition may have left a mark in their artistic representation. One of the most artistically featured communities within the, the crypto-Jewish midst was the one formed by the Portuguese migrants to Amsterdam at the end of the 17th century. These conversos, after having lived under Catholicism since the late 1400s, succeeded in making a full return to normative Judaism in the 1650s as a unified community. Perhaps this process of death and rebirth, referred to as the Phoenix of Abraham, may have been pivotal to bring Rembrandt's attention to the Portuguese Jewish returnees. After all, rare are the cases in history in which entire communities recover their ethnic, religious, and linguistic roots after centuries of duress, limbo, and persecution. We have the State of Israel as, as one of the examples, which is very rare. I believe Liberia would also fit into that. A well-known painting by Rembrandt is that of Manuel G. Soeiro, also known as Rabbi Menashe ben Israel. Born in Madeira Island in 1604 from conversal parents who escaped the Inquisition from mainland Portugal and who settled as Jews in Amsterdam in 1610. Among Rembrandt's other cedars of Morono stock were the young Abigail de Pina, wife of the Morono poet Miguel de Barrios. The family of Daniel Levi de Barrios, Rabbi Sol Levi Morteira, Spinoza, supposedly as the model for the piece titled The Man with the Magnifying Lens, and the medical doctor Ephraim Bueno, to name just a few. Was this saga of escape and return, death and rebirth, what enticed Rembrandt to repeatedly portray the Portuguese Jews of Amsterdam? Rembrandt had known many of these people personally, so one could only assume. To further translate the captivating aspect of artists with the crypto Jewish reality, one may, must seek to understand the, how the Iberian Jewish world viewed its people, and also how the Iberian world viewed its Jews. 
It is important to note that while religious extremism was the reality of Spain and Portugal during the 15th century, Iberian Jews had for 500 years already possessed an outstanding knowledge of mathematics, language, and specific method, and the scientific method, astronomy, and the trade routes. These skills were not only made, not only made them time-tested cartographers, guides, and explorers, but also gave them the reputation of being wandering Jews, a people without a land, liberals, internationalists, and staunch adherents of a uni universalist worldview. This also may have struck an artistic chord among creative people who surrounded the conversal community. Lavender, Dr. Lavender, who is at uh, FIU, um, a good friend of mine actually, he wrote an article titled Ex Libris. And he places universalism at the center of Jewish art, especially when the artist, him or herself, is of Jewish descent. Universalism is an important aspect of Jewish thought, and many Jewish artists have expressed universalism and hence their Jewish values in many of their paintings. Indeed, history shows the ease with which many crypto Jews fled or adapted to new realities when necessary. It may thus be said that the Converso's extensive inter internationalism gave way to the adoption of a universalist approach to life, clearly expressed in their politics, charitable acts, and relatedness to others. But who were the main artists who most eloquently, knowingly, or unknowingly added to the repertoire of crypto-Jewish art? And how did their artistic portrayals contribute to the further growth of a crypto-Jewish artistic language? Below are a few examples of just a few intriguing individuals. Although not of attested Jewish descent, he's most likely not Jewish, perhaps the artist who took the most risk as a recorder of the plight of the persecuted by the Holy Office was the Spanish court painter Francisco de Goya El Cientes. Goya, from his position of prominence in the late 1700s, saw up close the horrific acts of the Inquisition and recorded many visuals from Autos de Fe, these were the tribunals, where numerous crypto Jews were burned at a stake. In Los Caprichos, the Spanish painter invariably took the side of the persecuted and strongly criticized the brutality of Spanish society. <coughs> For instance, in his piece titled, Those Specks of Dust, Goya dealt directly with the Inquisition by boldly attack, attacking its arbitrary justice, by depicting the plight of a known personality of the day. The prisoner on trial was named Perico. It was a, a, a lady. As she appears in front of a mob of officials robed in a typical penitential uniform called San Benito. She sits hunched over, as if condemned in advance. Goya then remarks in his writings, Badly done. To treat an honorable woman in this way, a woman who for nothing served everyone so well and so usefully, badly done. Among all creative people, however, few artists were as influential and incrustable as the Baroque painter Diego Velázquez, who is Jewish. Born in the late 1500s, the Andalusian painter was the son of Portuguese conversos. His father was João Rodrigues da Silva, and his mother was Jerónima Velázquez, who belonged to the lower Hidalgo class and taught Diego the fear of God. The fear of God. That was the extent of uh, uh, their religious teaching to, to their son. There is perhaps no painting other than Las Meninas by Velázquez, which I'm sure most people are very familiar with, which better exemplifies a very peculiar crypto-Jewish element. The angst to belong, the perpetual need to affirm oneself as a worthy member of society. In her essay titled Velázquez and Las Meninas, Madeleine Milner Carr suggests that the enigmatic 
masterpiece was made with an ulterior mo motive in mind. That of granting Velasquez a coveted title that would ensure him a high place in society. Besides suggesting a heavily Flemish influence in Las Meninas, Carr's essay discusses Velasquez's desire for an aristocratic title greater than any single court position he could ever hold, concluding that what the descendant of conversos really wished for was ennoblement. In what seems to be an exemplary study of Velasquez's psyche, Carr analyzes the desperate use of light in Las Meninas. Coming from a master artist such as Velasquez, the use of light in, La in this painting seems surprisingly confusing. It appears to be coming from a slightly above horizontal center and off to the right. The face of the princess, try to visualize that painting. The face of the princess is illuminated from up and slightly to the right. But since the part in the hair of the female dwarf, and I, I'm sorry for this word, but that's what she uses, is illuminated and her right cheek is shadowed. And since, since the little boy's face is totally in the shadow, the light must be coming from slightly behind the plane that the dwarf is on. But if this is the case, it is difficult to explain how the mirror in the background seems so uniformly illuminated. Do you remember the mirror where you see the royal family and you also see Velasquez himself? With that being said, Carl then inadvertently reveals Velasquez's distorted issue of self-awareness, as the mirror hints at Velasquez's own unreality. Another unparalleled contributor to the conversal artistic language is, a, is artist Jaco, ja, Jacob Camille Pizarro. As you mentioned Pizarro, he was himself not a crypto-Jew, but a descendant of Portuguese Jews who were once crypto-Jews. So Pizarro, as he was best known, he was born in 1830 in Charlotte Amalie on the Caribbean island of St. Thomas, then under Danish control. His father was Abraham Gabriel Frederick Pizarro, who was born in Bordeaux, France, which had long had a strong Portuguese and Spanish Jewish community. His family had originated in Portugal, where for 300 years they had been Moranos. But as one of the world's greatest impressionists, Pizarro never once painted Jewish things, for his family was skeptical of religion. However, critics of his time insisted that his art was inevitably Jewish, for his Jewish, as well as his provincial background, was always to play a role in his emotional makeup. They thought that his emphasis on sympathetic portrayals of poor people constituted his spiritual contribution. He early on developed a compassion for, for the exploited, a, and positive portrayals of peasants formed a major, a majority of his paintings. Therein lies the artistic voice of Pizarro as a descendant of crypto Jews. He was an, an interpreter of the needy. He was an enabler for social justice. Pizarro was constantly regarded as a Jewish artist by his peers. As Renoir referred to him as that Israelite Pizarro. And while one could say that Pizarro even attempted to hide his Jewishness, he was still thought of as Jewish by other contemporary artists who, when seeing him strolling down Paris streets with sketchbooks in hand, referred to him as Moses with the tablets of the law. Other attributes that were also thought of as irrefutably Jewish were his universal inclinations and his belief that artists have social as well as aesthetic responsibilities. His eclectic ability to see different things in his booklish proclivities, proclivities. To read scientific literature on the diffraction of light. All were seen as part of his long-term Jewish tradition of textual focus. Another riveting character of conversal descent is the Italian artist Amadeo Modigliani, born in the Italian 
ghetto in the Bordo. His father died young, and his mother encouraged his de her delicate son in his aptitude for art. He was handsome, talented, sensitive, and extremely proud of his Jewish heritage. Modigliani became one of the most notorious characters in Montmartre. Modigliani's mother claimed descent from Baruch Spinoza. Spinoza never had kids, yet he claimed his descent. So we're not going to contest that, but let's accept it. Perhaps, you know, just a branch off of. Modigliani was famous for his princely lifestyle, even though he was always pain penniless, and for his belief in the artistic ex exceptionalism. And he viewed artists as special individuals with different values other than that of normal, ordinary people. Despite being eccentric, Modigliani displayed a truly conversal trait. As he became the leader of the School of Paris, his subjective and expressive art revealed his basic dignity, his despair, and the feeling of haunting melancholy. This melancholy, especially found among Portuguese crypto-Jews, is the saudades revealed in the Converso, which Modigliani seems to have inherited much of. It may thus be concluded that a powerful but inconspicuous cultural heritage left by the gente da nação, or by the nação israelita, is the following. A verifiable artistic language that has strongly influenced Western art from the dawn of the 15th century to today. Their vocabulary has been revealed through iconic characters, as well as through their lives and artwork. Their highly nuanced language is, however, only observable if one is cognizant of their history. For it is, and it was, by their arduous path that a distinguished means of artistic expression was formed. There you go. Mm -hmm. Thank you.